let's keep playing the game and see where we're at in emerging adulthood. Now this might be the phase of development that you're least familiar with. It actually wasn't coined until the 1990s. We tend to have adolescents than adults. But now we're aware there's a huge segment of the population, roughly in their college years, between ages 18 and 25, that don't feel like teenagers anymore, but they definitely don't feel like adults yet. There's something different. There's something in the middle. And so this immersion adulthood really helps us to understand more the college years when you're not a homeowner yet, you're not working in the workforce, and there seems to be a pause. This really tended to happen because more people than ever were getting a post-secondary education. People that go right to the workforce are much less likely to experience this phase of development. But as we can see here is in this stage, perhaps with the debate and critical thinking that is advocated for in university, that some people may reach Kohlberg's idea of post-conventional morality. According to Kohlberg, this is the idea that you move beyond what other people expect and you move beyond the rules to think about your own internal sense of justice and your own internal sense of what's right or wrong. This is the idea that in the Heinz dilemma, it might be about saving your wife, not just because other people expect you to, but because you owe it to your wife. You feel like that relationship has a bond and it's in the transactional nature of it, you owe it to them. Or you decide to cheat and give your friend the test answers, not because they want you to, but because you feel like you owe it to them and you want to help them. It's within the social bonds of a family or a romantic link or kids or a team that you feel this social contract. Or it just feels like the right thing to do. Maybe you think the test is flawed and who cares and the system is flawed so you're going to break it. It's important to note that many civil rights leaders that proposed civil disobedience were really in what Kohlberg defined as stage six, where they said the right thing to do is beyond the rules. And we know this. We know that at one point in time, slavery was legal. That's a terrible law. And so knowing what was right had to be breaking the rules and knowing that rules made by humans were flawed. And sometimes your sense of right or wrong goes beyond the rules that are prescribed to you. In terms of cognition, this is beyond jean Piaget's stages. And in fact, what we know is young adulthood tends to be the cognitive peak. At age 21 is when our memory works the best, when our information processing works the best, we can consume the most knowledge, and our emotional regulation is finally starting to get in the zone. Our brains, uh, the, especially prefrontal cortexes, they tend to finish maturing around age 25, so somewhere in the early 20s is when our brains are at their prime. Now, in terms of our psychosocial development, Erickson believed that 18 to 30-ish, a bit broader, was the time when most of us became very preoccupied with the notion of who are we going to spend our life with. Perhaps we're going to get married. Perhaps we're going to adopt kids or adopt puppies. Perhaps we're not interested in any family stuff, but we just want to have close friends and maybe a close roommate. Or maybe we want to take care of our elderly parents and that's who we want to dedicate care of life to. Or a sibling with disabilities. But this is the idea of getting a sense of who are the special people you want to spend your life with and how are you going to set that up and getting that in motion. So for a large segment of the population, this will play out as marriage, but there are other possibilities. Now, speaking of marriage and thinking of romantic relationships, this is really when attachment researchers see how much your attachment style can play out in romance. Imagine if your romantic partner had to go away for a two week seminar to train them and it would really advance their career. You couldn't go with them, so you had to be separated for two weeks. Some people might get really frustrated by that and they might just decide to break up for two weeks or go on a break for two weeks because they can't trust them and they assume they're going to cheat. That may be the person who has a more avoidant uh, attachment style who has a greater fear of commitment. Some people might be very over hyperly attached and call them every day and cry to them and guilt them out and shame them for doing this and bettering themselves. And those might be the people that have that anxious attachment where they just don't feel like they can trust them and they're constantly jealous. And then there's the people who might miss their significant other, but they're happy for them. And when they call them, when they do video chat with them once a day, they're smiling and they support them. And when they get home, they're gonna hug them tighter, that's for sure but they can make it through the two weeks because there is trust and love there. Now, important to note that if you become aware of your attachment style and you're conscious of it, you can work towards changing it. But if you don't become aware of it, we often just continue doing the default one we've had since infancy. 